that looks great in the animation. Yeah, there you go with a fan. <laughs> Some may recall my brother-in-law's JL Rubicon from many of my videos. He purchased it new and utilized it as his primary tool to explore Western America's beautiful backcountry. From day one, we never backed down from the difficult stuff and also churned up hundreds of highway miles to get us to the scenic stuff. After a few wonderful years of ownership and 20,000 miles on the odometer, we had to say farewell. My brother-in-law was given an offer he couldn't refuse, and the rugged JL is off to other adventures with new owners. But before we said goodbye, I took it on a test drive to hopefully grab enough footage for a review. So after 20,000 miles of putting the legendary Rubicon Wrangler through its paces, how does it stack up? Let's find out. Iconic styling aside, more than any other vehicle, the magic of the Wrangler platform lies underneath. The first thing that is apparent is the Wrangler's incredible approach angle. On standard tires, it checks in at 43.9 degrees, crushing the competition, and that's before modifications. The Extreme Recon package with 35-inch tires bumps this figure to 47.2. Next look at the beefy solid front axle. You don't hear Jeep owners whining about busted CV joints and boots. Yes, the axles and even axle housings can snap, but most of these rigs are running 40 inch plus tires. You can see from the steering linkages that the types of trail damage and repairs that I face running my Toyotas are quite frankly, not much of a concern for Jeep owners. Not to mention the beefy automatic sway bar disconnect, which gives the Wrangler class leading articulation. Right here you can see the length of the front long arm control arm linkages which help give the Jeep its articulation advantage. The exhaust here is routed above the frame bracing. If you recall on my Tacoma video it hangs low here and there is a concern of pinching the exhaust at this point on high brake over obstacles. But in the JL it shouldn't be a problem as you are going to get hung up on the frame cross member first. Notice the lack of underbody armor. And quite frankly, armor, while available for the Wrangler, isn't really that popular as it is for independent suspension equipped rigs. Why? Because the solid front axle setup keeps the body above the obstacles at all time, while an independent axle in comparison can actually lower your effective ground clearance in compression. Oh yeah, you have no flex. You just popped air in the back. Covered by more frame cross bracing is the 4 to 1 transfer case, which gives the Rubicon its amazing first gear 4 low crawl ratio. It should be noted that the four-door Wrangler Unlimited does suffer from a breakover angle concern due to the 118.4 inch wheelbase required to fit the extended 8-speed automatic transmission. This gives a listed breakover of 22.6 for standard tires and 26.7 degrees for the Extreme Rubicon on 35s. Respectable numbers, but not exactly amazing. The TRD Pro Tacoma on 31s has a better rating with the 127 inch wheelbase. The long gas tank has the only factory skid plate. Behind it are the control arms for the rear suspension. Due to the short overhang, the Wrangler has an excellent departure angle of 37 degrees and an astounding 40.4 for the Extreme Recon. The muffler is tucked up here tight, but other than the exhaust tip, which has a propensity to get pinched on extreme Moab drop-offs, the trailer hitch setup does a good job of acting as a skid plate to protect the rest of the exhaust. Okay, let's take a look at the driver's seat. Get a nice stitching, some the mirror controls because the mirrors are connected to the door. That's something that I believe the Ford Bronco fixed. They put the mirror on the body so when the doors are removed, you have mirrors. The power window controls are on the center. We'll show you that. Over here, we have the seat again as part of the hose out interior. Everything is manual, so let's get in. Tilt and telescoping steering wheel. I just kind of like it up almost so I can see the gauges. I sit kind of vertical anyway. It's comfortable. It's a comfortable driving position. These seats are nice. I don't know how they would hold up on a long-term journey. 
My brother-in-law never stated they were uncomfortable. I do like the leather. If I was getting a Jeep Rubicon, I would order the leather. Jumping now to the interior, we have 12 volt and USB sockets covered by nice caps. Under the media cap is a standard USB, USB-C, and the aux input. Between the cup holders is a spot for the key fob. The center console has two trays, a shallow one that I would use for my record keeping book and papers, and a deep one for larger items, which also has a USB port for charging. The glove box is ultra small, but about what you'd expect in a modern vehicle where a lot of the room has to be reserved for the airbag. Inside is a great spot for the tools to remove the Freedom Top and the owner's manual. The manual comes in a nice outdoorsy canvas case, which is really cool. Up top is a nice place to store national park maps, wallets, and cell phones. The combined weight according to the yellow sticker is 850 pounds, including gear and passengers. This has always been Jeep's Achilles heel. If you had four 200 pound adults in your Jeep, you wouldn't even have enough weight capacity left for a winch and some food. The floor mats are nicely molded to trap water and mud and fit the well nicely. And the red stitched Rubicon branded seats are nice and give the rugged Jeep a softer and more luxurious interior. The modern gauge cluster is also very attractive and easy to read. The rear seating area is also nicely appointed for a vehicle of this type and makes my Tacoma look almost archaic. The molly webbing on the back of the seats is great for mounting packs and there is netting below to store small items. The center seat reveals a fold down armrest with a slot for a phone and two cup holders. The fact that my 2022 Tacoma doesn't have something like this is inexcusable and I don't think the fourth generation has one either. Another thing the back of my contemporary Toyota lacks is the entertainment hub on the rear of the center console, which has AC vents, two X USB C's, two standard USBs, and the AC inverter. All right, I've been somewhat dreading this review. Where do you, where do you start with the vehicle as iconic as the Jeep Wrangler, and especially a JL, which has been out for a couple of years now, and there's so much content on this vehicle. So what could I add to this? And where do I even begin? But the Jeep Wrangler Rubicon is just flat out the best all around technical off-road vehicle on the market today. We just need to come to an understanding that overall, and especially low range technical off-road, the Jeep Wrangler is just the one to be, it is. And once we come to that conclusion, we can discuss the pros and cons of this chassis design and how they designed it. It's kind of like on my Lexus LX470 review where I said, the great thing about the Land Cruiser is that it is average at everything. It's just a jack of all trades. Well, the Wrangler design philosophy is a little bit different. It is the ultimate off-roader first and foremost. And everything else is secondary to that. So the question then is, is it the best Overlander? And that's where you could get a lot of discussion and a lot of opinions, and this may be the Overland vehicle for you, it may not be. And so I'm hoping in this review, we will take a look at the nuances of this vehicle, and then hopefully you can make a decision about if this vehicle is right for you. So again, what makes this the ultimate off-roader? Well, first and foremost, in the Rubicon trim, it is the drivetrain. You've got solid front and rear axles. That's really where it all begins. And then the transfer case, they have added a four to one gear reduction. Regular vehicles are about two to one. So you can crawl super low. This means even with the 410 gears, you can put on the bigger tires and not re-gear and still have plenty of low range. Then again, if you re-geared, you'd get even more crawl control. The solid front axle linkage design not only allows you to protect your axle shafts, whereas on an independent suspension, your CV axles are wide open for damage, especially the boots. It not only protects those, but it allows for extreme articulation. Not only that, but Jeep even went a step further with its electronic sway bar disconnect, which will give, which will give even more articulation. And we've seen that advantage play out 
especially over some of the trails that we filmed, Rose Garden Hill, Golden Spike. We've seen it play out on those trails where it is much better to have all four wheels on the ground and then lock them than it is to have three wheels or two wheels, which you end up getting with the independent suspended vehicle. And then to top it off, Jeep made sure that you had very good approach angle, very good departure angle. The brake over, it's not the best, and that's because the wheelbase, which I think is one of the negatives of the Ranger Rubicon Unlimited, they put the new, for the JL, they put the new eight-speed transmission in. And when they put the eight-speed transmission in, they had to lengthen the already long JK. They had to lengthen that in order to fit everything in. So we're at about a 118 inch wheelbase. And to me, that's pretty long. I don't really feel it. I might, uh, we're looking at the video footage now. I might regret what I said about the washboards. They're starting to get a little bit, a little bit more noticeable here, I should say. And I can see the camera flaking. So we'll see how well that is. Oh, we just hit the washboard. And you know what, to be honest, it's not as bad as I thought this solid front axle would be. In fact, it's quite composed. I do, I do feel it in the steering. You can start to feel it down below. There's a deer. Braking is good. Wouldn't want to hit a deer on my brother-in-law's Rubicon. A lot of people like this longer wheelbases for areas such as Sand Hollow where they have really big steps. Put big tires on and you can climb up those steps. The beauty of the Jeep is <laughs> this platform is essentially in three wheelbases. You've got the short wheelbase of the two-door, you've got this wheelbase at 118, and then you've got the Gladiator, which I think is around 130 somewhere. So really, if you're the type of person that just wants nearly the ultimate off-road vehicle, and you don't want to do a lot of work to it, just get it right out of the gate, this is the one to buy. It really is. The Rubicon trim, look no further. It's got everything you want. It will maintain its resale value. This is the one you want. Now, if you were trying to build a dedicated rock crawler, that's where, do you really want the Rubicon? And that's because there's so much you can do to modify this vehicle. You can add new axles, even new transfer cases, engine swaps. So you're thinking, do I really want to pay for what the Rubicon gives me? If you're going to swap this out, put Dana 80s in or something bigger, and you're going to put an Atlas transfer case in, there's no reason to get the Rubicon trim. Just buy whatever JL Wrangler trim you like that has the interior you like, and then go to town and modify. Quadratech, one of the Jeep online outfitters, they now ask what kind of Jeep vehicle you own. Back when I was a kid, when we had our CJ7, Quadratech just sent out one magazine. But when the JK and the JL came out, they really took it to the next level, and now they ask, what Jeep do you want? You say the JL or the JK, and you get a thick catalog for just that vehicle. And so if customizing and modification is your thing, again, this is the vehicle you want. Its design philosophy from day one was really the ultimate off-roader in a day or short type weekend warrior type trip. Having awesome payload capacity over a supple suspension was not an option. They went with the supple suspension. There is the payload capacity was improved on the JL compared to the JK, thanks to the use of aluminum in the construction, but that was not really a design philosophy. Roof load, again, was not a huge design philosophy. They wanted the open air experience of the Freedom Top, okay? And there's nothing like driving in the open air off-road in a Jeep Wrangler. But again, there's also nothing like trying to put a roof rack on a Jeep Wrangler. You end up with, um, we had the Rhino rack on this. They had what they call the backbone system, and it's got plates that fit in the rear quarter panel, which drill in through the roof to mount that roof rack on. You sometimes have support pillars on the A pillar. I know they do that a lot on the JKs. Again, it's just not designed originally to carry that roof load. So again, that's something where that's something where if you're thinking about this for an overlander, you'll have to decide, is the Wrangler the platform I want or do I want to go something like the Toyota? With my 100 series Land Cruiser, when I installed the ARB base rack, I just pulled the factory roof rails off. They only used a couple of the mounting on the roof. The, the Toyota from the factory actually put 
extra roof supports for heavier duty or different style roof racks. So installing my roof rack was a cakewalk. I didn't have to drill into the roof, didn't have to risk any of that. It was already there. Also, cargo loadout. Again, for the Jeep design, this is interior cabin space is narrow. It's not wide like my, like my Land Cruiser. It's a lot more narrow. And then you've got these fenders on the outside to allow the track to articulate. I believe the, the um, width of this is 73, 74 inches, and my Land Cruiser is 76, so it's a couple inches narrower than my Land Cruiser on the track width. But then when you get into the interior compartment, it is much, much narrower in load space than my Land Cruiser is. So we joke with my brother-in-law, I joke with him that he has to pack like a backpacker for his trips with his two boys. I've got so much more room to carry the cargo. Um, he's got a larger fridge. He was at one point talking, hey, maybe we should swap fridges because it's hard for him to use his larger fridge in this vehicle compared to mine. The noise on the interior cabin, again, from that weekend warrior type design with the removable top, I can hear this, this fiberglass creak and squeak as I move back and forth. While my Lexus, on the other hand, is just whisper quiet until I put the roof rack on with all of my gear strapped on it. But it should be noted, however, because a lot of these overland trips are long distance driving and the squeaks and the noises, they all add up with regards to driver fatigue. The miles per gallon on here looks like he's got 18 miles per gallon average. You know, he's built as tall as my Lexus and he's getting significantly better gas mileage than my Lexus. I've talked to my brother-in-law, especially with the rooftop tent on, he would get a lot of windage. The wind would blow. I mean, it's slab sided and that supple, again, that supple suspension couldn't really road hold as well. And so when we were going on the freeway, we were taking it easy on the interstate and he would go a lot slower than I would on the highway, especially when we'd have crosswinds. And he would comment, he's all, do you notice that crosswind? And on the Lexus, I wouldn't notice it, but he would on this. So that's something, that's something to take into account. There are so many options for the Jeep Wrangler JL, and that's why we're just gonna focus on this Rubicon trim with the Pentastar V6. Now you've got everything from a turbocharged four-cylinder to a EV vehicle, hybrid, diesel, and even the 392 V8. We'll just stick with this Pentastar, and I've, I've kind of been pleased with the Pentastar V6. It gets decent mileage on and off the trail, and seems to have plenty of power for highway driving. It doesn't sound nearly as good as a V8, but I think with the savings you'd get in your wallet, it makes it worth it. Where I am seating, it reminds me a little bit of my Discovery, but not as bad. It's just right below the sun visor, where I was on my Discovery 2, my eye line is right on the sun visor, so I'm always driving like this. This I'm, I'm seeing kind of low. It gives me a good view of the trail in front of me, but it would have been nice if that window would be just a little bit taller. I can see the trail very good. It's just looking out is not as comfortable as I would like it to be. But still off-road, still off-road, I can lean out and see where I'm going, but not as good as say in a CJ7 or a TJ. You're a little more cramped and tank-like in this vehicle than you were in some of the older vehicles. And I, I don't know if that's a combination of modern style where we just don't like windows anymore for whatever reason, or if that's a safety reason for side impacts. It, I don't know if that's... I'm sorry. <laughs> Your views coming out here aren't as good as say, the classic Jeeps or a TJ Wrangler. That said, you can always pull the doors off. Remember, this is the weekend warrior design. You can pull the doors off, the roofs off, and then you've got all the visibility you need. One thing to note, having these, these big open fenders is allowing this Jeep with its 118 inch wheelbase on 35 by 1250 tires to actually do a circle in a really nice tight turn radius. So that really helps with the wheelbase issue here. The more I drive this, the more I think, you know what? For this vehicle, 
I don't think that 118 inch wheelbase is gonna be that big of a deal. My brother-in-law kept telling me that. I kept saying, no, I enjoy 100 to 105. My Land Cruiser is pushing it because it's a little more than 105. But this vehicle does not feel, even though it's width footprint, it's only a couple inches narrower than my Land Cruiser, it feels much more nimble, significantly more nimble. And giving it a little bit of throttle, it's not, yeah, solid front axle is horrible. It's very subtle. It's, you, you can feel over some of the bumps, the harshness of the solid axle suspension going over these rocks here. Yeah, like these rocks here. I, and again, I'm, I'm running full tire pressures here. When I do this review, you knock these tires down to 20 PSI or even a little lower and a lot of that is going to go away. It's fun to drive. It wants to be driven. And to me, as an enthusiast, I appreciate that. This is a vehicle that not only looks good on the outside, but when you get inside, it is fun to drive. The dashboard layout is perfect. It's informative. It's a good mix of modern, but still classic design layout. We still have manual controlled knobs and dials and toggle switches, which, I definitely prefer because then I can make adjustments without taking my eyes off the road. Whoa, there's a bump too. You guys are all going to be laughing about my, how, how I'm saying the solid axles are no big deal. They're no big deal. It is essentially a modern version of the Defender 110 and you have Land Rover telling us there is just no demand for a rugged solid axle body on frame SUV. If we made one, no one would buy it. Well, Land Rover, maybe if you made one, no one would buy it if it was so expensive, but this vehicle is selling 200,000 units per year. Let that sink in. It just appeals to so many people. Someone who wants to just have fun with the top off on the beach, you've got it. Someone who wants to blast through the desert, you've got it. Take a drive through the canyon with the top off, you've got it. Overland for a significant amount of times, the vehicle can do it. Well, if cargo space, ultimate long range highway comfort, roof rack ability accessories was your primary concern, I would go for the Forerunner, save some money. But if you want that edge on off-road capability and want to deal with weird ways to mount a roof rack and packing light like a backpacker, then yeah, the Jeep Rubicon is the one you want. Now the Bronco, the Ford Bronco now is gunning to dethrone the Jeep as king of off-road. So now you're saying, well, okay, these are two different weekend warrior style vehicles and we're gonna make them overlanders. What do I pick now, the Rubicon or the Bronco? Well, this becomes a little more difficult. The more nuance is gonna to be towards size and suspension. If you want the rock crawling suspension, then the Rubicon is obviously the one you want. That's the easy decision. The rock, you value the rock crawling, get the Rubicon over the Bronco, all right? But the Bronco is gonna be very good in and of itself with its independent suspension and the ability to lock both front and rear axles, but the width of the Bronco becomes an issue here. Now, that works both ways. If you intend to go on tight, narrow trails, the Jeep is gonna be way more comfortable because of how much more narrower it is. But if that is not an issue for you, the Bronco may actually have more cargo space and I, it looks like it's gonna be a little bit easier to do roof racks and everything on the Bronco than it is the Wrangler. So that may lead you over to the Ford's perspective there. So even though while I said at the beginning of the video that the Jeep Wrangler is the all around technical off-roading king, there are legitimate reasons why you may not want to choose this platform or may not be happy for this platform for extended long travel. Well, that's it. I hope you enjoyed our drive along in the Jeep Rubicon Wrangler JL. And I hope that answered some of your questions you may have had about the platform. If you have others, please comment, please like, and please subscribe. That really is the best way that you can encourage us to 
make more and similar content, and I hope to see you guys out on the trail.